So to anyone in the knitting and crochet world, I'm sure Ravelry is a familiar name and place. Sometimes it's described as like the Facebook of the knitting world, but it's kind of unlike other social media platforms in the space because it is that mix of e-commerce and community, all centered around yarn crafts. Ravelry was first founded in 2007 by Cassidy and Jessica Forbes as a place for knitters, crocheters, designers, spinners, and dyers to unite over their common interest. The website had a search section to seek out and purchase patterns, a workspace with yarn and project tracking, and a community portion with forums and message boards. Over the years, it grew and it grew, and as of March 2020, it had almost 9 million registered users and approximately 1 million monthly active users. So Ravelry made a lot of headlines in 2019 and in 2020, with sources such as the New York Times, The New Yorker, Psychology Today, Time Magazine, The Washington Post, NPR, Vox, and many more, all reporting on the changes made by Ravelry that we are going to discuss today. A knitting website seems innocuous, but as we know where there are people, there can be contention and division and just as we see on other forms of social media there needs to be rules in place to keep the peace. Crafting and politics have a history of being intertwined with often women speaking out on issues via their craft. This was seen in 2017 with the movement of the Pussy Hat Project. Um, it went through the United States and women were making and wearing pink hats to wear at the Women's March. This swept through Ravelry at the time, with one of the knitting patterns having over 100,000 downloads, but it was not just access to the pattern on Ravelry, but it was a place of community to discuss the issues. So in 2019, hats were published with pro-Trump statements, more specifically a hat with the words, build the wall. Um, and it brought a lot of discourse out on the site that turned pretty nasty, complete with a lot of threats being made and posted in the forums. Then in June 2019, the same user who had published the uh, build the wall hat created a cowl that said keep America great. This pattern was flagged for hate speech and the designer was banned from Ravelry on June 21st. Then on June 23rd 2019 Ravelry released a statement that included the following. It said, we are banning support of Donald Trump and his administration on Ravelry. This includes support in the form of forum posts, projects, patterns, profiles, and all other content. Note that we will not destroy project notebook data. If a project needs to be removed from the site, we'll make sure you have access to your data. Even if you are permanently banned from Ravelry, you will still be able to access any patterns that you've purchased. Also, we will make sure that you receive a copy of your data. We cannot provide a space that is inclusive of all and also allow support for open white supremacy. Support of the Trump administration is undeniably support for white supremacy. They updated the community guidelines with this information as well. So this statement really led to a mass exodus of conservative knitters and brought a lot of media attention. Now as someone outside the United States, I can very much agree with this and openly denounce white supremacy, but the part that stood out to me was that he was the current elected president at the time, with obviously more than 50% of the country voting for him. So to draw the line not at denouncing white supremacy, which could include some of his statements, but to draw it at mention of the president himself was kind of surprising to me. Many of the news articles interviewed um, people on all different sides of the spectrum in reacting to this news. Um, so rather than reading their comments individually, I'll link the articles below and summarize some of what I've read. First, many pro-Trump fans were upset that their individual projects, such as a hat with Trump 2020, were removed from the site and saw many comments that distinctly anti-Trump hats were perfectly allowable um, without consequence. Former users got to work on creating websites that stated all political opinions were welcome without censorship, and even some of the supporters of the ban found the move controversial, stuck between valuing free speech and agreement that Ravelry had done the right thing in drawing the line there. Of course, Ravelry is a private company and can make decisions on their values and political beliefs, leaving those who disagree to either stay and be quiet or to leave. Uh, ultimately, once the ban was in place, the people who were unhappy about the decision decided what to do, primarily left the platform, and Ravelry continued on, saying they were making the space safer for marginalized people, and they had many supporters in doing this. So for the people remaining, it's easy to see why the next controversy seems extra upsetting. Moving ahead, one year later, June 2020, and Ravelry launches a redesign of the website. Now up until this point, Ravelry's look was largely unchanged since the initial creation of the website. Even in some of the news coverage regarding the Trump 
that, I noticed that there were some notes about how dated the website was. Um, more specifically, in the MIT Technology Review, they had an article that noted, the site is pretty ugly. Its tab structure, fonts, and blocky formatting recall on an earlier, simpler time on the internet when chat rooms reigned. It hasn't updated its design since it launched in 2007. So Ravelry launched the design with a blog post three days later um, that described the journey to make these changes where they explained that the redesign process started in January 2019 and although no comments were made publicly prior to the launch, so it was a surprise to all the users. The platform is huge with over 800 pages that needed individual updating and they waited for all the pages to be complete prior to launching. So we have seen resistance to change on basically every social media platform since its inception, but the pushback to these changes was like no other, with concerns more serious than just not liking the update. So I'll include some in screenshots here of the before and after of several pages, not my own, and I'll include where they were linked from down in the description box. And on a surface level, I'll agree these don't look hugely different. The launch was met with a lot of vocal criticism and claims that kind of vary from the designs being actively harmful to just general dislike and annoyance at the change. Updates and changes are never universally embraced and especially midway through 2020, um, a major change of something trusted and no one was especially unwelcome. So for the people unaffected, um, looking at the sites, I saw one comment that I'll just read here. It said, it's basically the same site with maybe a tad more white space. I see the claim that the font is different, but I stared at the screenshots for a long time trying to figure out what's different about it. The new design feels more restful to my migraine prone eyes. Certainly it's better on mobile. Now, aside from the more extreme reactions, um, not saying they're unjust, but on the harmful side of the spectrum. I feel like this is kind of a lot of the sentiment. Like it's different, but it wasn't a huge change for a lot of people and especially people coming in. Um, the old side does seem really clunky and old. So an update was needed, but people started to report eye strain, migraines, dizziness, blurred vision, and even seizures. Additionally, people found that screen reader software was incompatible with the changes that gave fewer people access to the website. A major concern was that Ravelry was just not designed with accessibility as a core concern, even though Ravelry also was not designed with accessibility in mind either. Um, in one article I read by Amberly Romo, she explains that only 25 to 35% of web accessibility issues can be automatically detected without user feedback. And even so, both the classic and new Ravelry feature a host of violations and warnings. The Ravelry team said that the goal was to retain the existing HTML with changing the visuals, so the underlying structure was neither improved nor worsened. Most of the concerns seem to be brought about the animations, especially to the login and home pages, the new icons, and the combination of the new font on the pure white background. So picture the launch of this new design. The Ravelry staff are excited about this new change and there is an uproar from the users. Now I do feel that the reaction of the Ravelry staff is what elevated this situation and ultimately changed Ravelry forever. <laughs> So picture the launch of this new design. Ravelry staff are excited about these new changes and there is an uproar from the users. Ravelry staff had a choice at this point and I would say that it is the reaction of the Ravelry staff that elevated this situation and ultimately changed the site forever. Rather than recognizing the concerns of the users, they got defensive and doubled down. And just like YouTuber apologies, reacting from this place rarely ends well. One of the founders, Cassidy, started tweeting designers, posting what looked to be official statements and responding to emails with the core message being clear that Ravelry did not believe that the people who were experiencing issues were telling the truth and if anything they were just waiting for the problem to go away. This caused even more problems until the other founder, Jessica, apologized for Cassidy's response and essentially distanced the company from her responses. She also apologized for people being upset without actually acknowledging the reason that they were upset. Ravelry prided themselves on being an inclusive website. At the time, the first sentence of their Twitter bio read, inclusive, friendly website for yarn people around the world. Many questioned why the motto of inclusion didn't include people with disabilities or make it a priority in creating an accessible website. From the beginning of the issues being posted, people banded together and requested the site be changed back to the classic Ravelry design with the option to opt in while they worked maybe with the accessibility professional and conducted testing with the people being affected. There were many vocal users who requested this change and who received the support of hundreds others. 
Even so, these moves were not made and Ravelry kept up the new design. The American Epilepsy Association got involved. They tweeted about the website, basically confirming that seizures are possible from websites without really specifically confirming that that's what was going on here. Psychology Today wrote a piece saying it seemed to be an ordinary website with some of the users reporting problems claiming it happened hours or days after viewing the website, possibly not even due to the site at all, and seeing the outrage as a case of mass psychogenic illness. That did not go over very well within the community, of course. Rivalry did start to post about some changes that they were making. They gave people the option to toggle back to classic Ravelry for a period of time, which was until February 2020, although you did have to navigate through the site to get to that option. They also put out a survey, which some people found disingenuous as it was difficult to navigate between kind of screenshot comparisons and may not have given an accurate picture of what was, you know, actually needed to change. They also removed the animations and eventually did make it more accessible to screen readers by changing the icons and how it read bullet points. Even with these changes, some users report the site continues to be unusable with the high contrast text. So that's the end of the official updates, but I did want to say that even though I was not personally affected by the redesign and overall I would say I liked and preferred the changes, this still changed Ravelry for me um, and not just my own support of people who um, were experiencing problems, but in researching this video I went back to some of the community groups that I used to frequent and all of them have gone silent. Even if Ravelry did not want to address the concerns, um, the individual group hosts or creators uh, wanted to move it off site so that all of their community members could participate. Some moved to Discord, others to Facebook, and some just disseminated after all of this. So it kind of leads me to the question, like what happened and why did it all seem so personal? So unlike Facebook or other large social media, Ravelry always maintained a small team with only five staff members. They never prioritized monetization. They didn't sell the company for a profit. People felt a personal sense of like trust and pride in the site. The founders were active in the community and up until this point they were proactive in the causes and feedback of the community. So when a large portion of the community brings forward concerns and the staff are dismissive and unresponsive, people do take it personally because it feels personal. Plus for a community that is known for being proactive and progressive in addressing concerns, it feels like a slap in the face to people with disabilities who are experiencing these issues. So looking back, there has been some discourse on whether the portion of people experiencing concerns was inflated. People jumping on the bandwagon of criticism or exaggerating their problems. And while we can only trust that people are honest in their experiences, it can be difficult when it's just a small portion of people experiencing these concerns. And I'm sure for the staff of Ravelry, the fact that they just invested in a designer plus a year and a half of work to designing the site, um, it may have felt like an impossible task to change it. But really the response amplified these problems and broke the trust between the users and the staff and reinforced the fact that this is all ultimately a company and not a community. A lot of longtime users left. To this day, people still sell on Ravelry, but not exclusively. I regularly see pattern links to Ravelry, yes, but also Etsy, Payhip, Gumroad, and a lot of other options. And while these platforms do e-commerce and are a perfectly fine option, it also split the community. Now a lot of people try to create their own community through the other social media or community group. However, it is much less centralized, at least in my opinion and experience. Ravelry is still a busy place with new patterns being posted all the time and I'm sure new users can find the community there and old users who evolve with the changes um, can find what they need with what it is right now. But as someone who's been involved but somewhat passively through all of this, accessing the services, joining some groups and commenting occasionally, it has been very evident that the places that I used to frequent are not what they once were. So I find myself spending much less time on there than I used to, even though that change has been somewhat unconscious. So I would love to know what you have to say about this whole rivalry situation. Looking back, are you still spending as much time there as you are used to, or are you new to the knitting world, and what has been your experience as a new user? I would love to continue this conversation with you in the comments.